Hello, my name is Luke and I'm here to ask you to imagine a world where Pokemon never got popular. I know what you're thinking. It sounds like in this world I could have got a lot more things done. But perhaps don't be flippant, viewer, because this parallel world where Pokemon was never popular came perilously close to being our world. And if not for one mythical Pokemon, a genuinely risky bit of 11th hour coding, and a competition in a Japanese kids magazine, that's the terrifying present we'd be occupying today. Can you catch them all? Can you eat them all? This is how Mew saved Pokemon. By accident. The first thing you need to know, or perhaps just be reminded of, is that the Western world arrived staggeringly late to the Pokemon party. The sensation that's sweeping Japan is about to invade your Game Boy. The very first Pokemon games came out in Japan in February 1996, a whopping two and a half years before North American Game Boy owners would even get a sniff of a Snorlax. Those games were Pocket Monsters Red and Green, and differed from the Red and Blue versions that would eventually arrive in the West in several ways. First, the box art for the Japanese games was was, I don't think it's controversial to say, better. Second, the Pokemon looked, I don't think it's controversial to say, worse. I'm sorry Nintendo, perhaps it's a cultural difference, but here in the West we expect cats to have knees. There was a third difference with the Japanese release, and that's that unlike when Pokemon was released in the US, not a lot of people wanted to buy it. Today, Pokemon's appeal, making two cute things fight until one is unconscious, feels so obvious it's weird to imagine the first games not being smash hits, but bizarrely that was the case. In a conversation with developer Game Freak and the Pokemon company around the launch of Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver in 2009, late Nintendo boss Satoru Iwata recalls the number of red and green cartridges produced for launch being less than he'd expected, and even that limited number not exactly flying off the shelves. Nintendo wasn't even surprised by this weak performance. Why? Well, expectations for Pokemon were low for the same reason that my academic performance in the 90s was low. The Game Boy. Although the whole premise of the game was having a roster of monsters you could carry around with you portably, the fact these games were built for the Game Boy was a huge stumbling block. Nintendo's handheld at this point was very much past its heyday, over six years old, with Pocket Monsters Red and Green having been in development for roughly as long. Speaking to Polygon, composer Junichi Masuda recalled, Even when we were talking to our friends in the industry, they were like, Really? You're working on a Game Boy game? That's not going to sell very well, don't you think? Which shows that A, Mr. Masuda needs nicer friends, and B, Pokemon had a problem. Luckily, it also had a plucky team of developers who, having worked on the game for six years, weren't afraid to break it irreparably right before it came out. As we've already covered, for 1996, the Game Boy kind of sucked, hardware-wise. Squeezing an RPG of this scale onto a weenie Game Boy cartridge was already a huge job, and Game Freak had to make a lot of tough calls, cutting dozens of planned Pokémon, and making decisions like, do we want to give players three save slots, or the ability to rename Pokémon? To which I would simply have said, keep both and get rid of Execute. But hey, I wasn't in the room. I mean, I was about seven years old, and in a different hemisphere and I don't speak Japanese, but apart from that I should have been consulted. With Pokemon Red and Green complete, the very last thing was to remove the debug features from the code, which, having served their purpose in making the game stable and not horrendously glitchy, weren't needed on the final cartridge. Removing them freed up, according to Game Freak's Shigeki Morimoto, a microscopic 300 bytes of data. But of course, you cannot use those bytes, because at this point you've debugged the game and everything works, so any further tinkering at that point could be extremely disruptive, is a fact Game Freak briefly considered before taking those 300 bytes and cramming a Mew in there. You probably recognise Mew, the psychic-type mythical Pokémon who, and there's no nice way to say this, looks quite a lot like a cat fetus, and occupies the special 151st place in the Pokémon Gen 1 Pokédex. Mew's official description in that first game describes it as so rare that it's said to be a mirage, but frankly that doesn't even begin to cover the status this Pokémon holds. Because when Pokémon Red and Green came out in Japan, Mew was in no way an official or visible part of the game. Game Freak had buried Mew in the code, seemingly on a whim, and publisher Nintendo had no idea Mew existed. This sub-300 bytes magic cat was added by the developers at the last minute, with no plans for it to ever be revealed, and players were told explicitly to go find 150 Pokémon and no more. Forget the monster. A mission that, as we've already covered, hardly anyone undertook, because Pokémon was not a hit. With Pokémon withering on the vine like a dehydrated Ivysaur, it's likely that Game Freak would have simply moved on, and Mew would never have been revealed in any capacity. But luckily, as we've already covered, Pokémon Red and Green are a glitchy piece of crap.
Indeed, the relatively few people playing the first Pokemon games were starting to report brief glimpses of something much more exciting than distorted blocks of balked Pokemon. Actual glimpses of what was clearly a secret, unacknowledged creature, glimpsed only under exceptional and hard to replicate circumstances, and trawled up from deep and hidden parts of the game's code. Game Freak had absolutely not planned on creating video gaming's most famous and fervently sought after urban myth, but that's exactly what they did. In a time before gameplay could be easily recorded and shared, rumours of Mew's existence were just that – rumours. Pokemon's early success was entirely down to word of mouth hype amid players, and the Mew myth was on the leading edge of that hype. Spotting this, Nintendo was quick to capitalise, presumably after delivering a substantial bollocking to Game Freak for putting a magic cat in the game when they weren't supposed to. Nintendo had the perfect ally in the Pokemon Fightback, the monthly manga magazine Koro Koro Comic, which had taken a gamble on a licensing deal for the Pocket Monster franchise. This comic and its spin-offs, which started in the 70s and still runs today, has a huge audience of elementary school-aged kids, and in the first half of 1996 started to feature Pokemon comics and new news, like advice on how to beat the first gym leaders. I don't speak Japanese, but I assume this mostly says don't have already picked Charmander. Then in April 1996, Koro Koro Comic, which at this point was kind of the official mouthpiece for Pokemon, dropped an absolute bombshell. A double page spread that ended the intense speculation and revealed, incredibly, Mew was real. A mythical 151st Pokemon discovered by Professor Oak that apparently couldn't be found on your game cartridge, but that 20 lucky Koro Koro readers could win by entering a competition. Specifically, by sending in a postcard with your name, address, phone number, what grade you're in, and answers to the questions what's your favourite Pokemon and why, and least favourite Pokemon and why, which is easy, Vulpix, cutest face, and Pinsir, it knows what it did. Satoru Iwata is quoted as recalling the Koro Koro competition as the point where Pokemon's fortunes reversed. Although only 20 Mews were being offered up, the comic received a shocking 78,000 entrants. Which is even more surprising when you bear in mind that in those days, the winners had to post their precious Pokemon cartridges to Nintendo, then wait anxiously to see whether it eventually came back with a Mew on it or got lost in the mail. The Mew hype was paying off, word of mouth was spreading, and a rapidly rising number of Game Boy owners were discovering what we in the future have all known for years, that Pokemon is actually a super good and fun RPG. Weekly sales of red and green started to equal previous monthly sales, and kept accelerating from there. Eventually, Pokemon topped the charts a full year and a half after it first came out. A certified hit at last, another year later Pokemon was released to the US, and its worldwide and enduring popularity was cemented. Mew became a beloved and iconic part of the Pokemon roster, although its status as an urban legend also endured, with playgrounds full of kids worldwide absolutely convinced the mythical Pokemon could somehow be found under this oddly placed truck in the game's Vermilion City, as if the vehicle's owner had run Mew over and ditched the before the cops showed up. All this excitement can be directly traced back to that original glitchy Mew in the game's code. It's the kind of bug that game developers dream of, the kind that ends up saving your game. And it's a reminder that for all Pokemon's immense marketing power today, it owes all of its success to that most potent force in video games, kids telling each other about something they're doing that's fun. And also a reminder of a time when glitches like Mew could become urban legends, long before kids were one Google search away from finding out that you can actually get Mew in the game for real really quite easily, by using the move Teleport right after alerting this particular trainer battle by Cerulean City, then when the pause button stops working, defeat the trainer with a slowpoke just to the east, and immediately teleport again. Mm -hmm. Fuck yeah, I'm trying this.